Collins & Co's not-for-profit conference, Be Empowered Through Knowledge, is designed specifically for the not-for-profit sector. Our speakers are experts in this sector and their practical approach provides not-for-profit board members and management with the opportunity to improve their skills and knowledge across a range of specialist topics. The conference also provides a great networking opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elliot. Thanks for uh, having me here. It's um, wonderful to see people still convening in Melbourne or anywhere around the world these days uh, in this time of fear and anxiety. Um, I had the privilege of speaking at this conference two years ago and uh, my connection to Collins & Co runs all the way back to 2008. Um, as a 23-year-old, my two business partners and I used Collins & Co to incorporate Bygut and uh, they probably thought we were crazy early to mid 20 year olds uh, trying to change the world, but um, Collins & Co uh, happily helped us, registered our company and informed us what a company limit to a guarantee was and uh, what we needed to do to, uh, to become a non-profit. And uh, thanks to that initial backing by Collins & Co, uh, Waiga has, as was just mentioned, gone on to improve the lives of over half a million people across Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Asia Pacific. So, always indebted to Collins and & Co and happy to receive their emails to uh, participate in these uh, not-for-profit conferences. I uh, have been asked to, to look at um, ethical and political trends uh, impacting young Australians. Um, but uh, I wanted to touch on a, a few different issues. There's a lot of places one can go with um, a topic so broad. And there are a lot of different issues we can explore. Um, but in the time we have, and quite conscious that I, I'm the only person standing between you and lunch uh, that's been delayed, I, um, I have only picked two topics. Uh, so I'm going to walk through a, a national and a, a global issue um, that I think are really sitting at the heart of what many young people are thinking about and concerned about. Uh, this is not uh, exclusive. Of course, there's uh, so many divergent issues that young people care about and I probably need to put a caveat in there by virtue of the fact that I turned 35 last year, so I'm technically not a young person anymore. So uh, I'm being shuffled out of the youth conferences that I once was uh, at centre stage on and now reminded that with going a, a bit grey and uh, slightly bored that uh, I'm entering a new phase of my life. So this may be the last speech I ever speak about young people. Um, so. I guess for me, um, still with a heartbeat connected to young Australians, uh, why this is important is in Australia and globally, I think um, many young people and people of all generations are experiencing a trust deficit, a breakdown of institutional trust, and that is feeding concern, anxiety, fear, frustration, depression, and I'm not just talking about the coronavirus. I'm talking about the breakdown in institutional trust uh, across so many segments of our society. Uh, media, politics, uh, religious institutions, corporate Australia with endless royal commissions going on and uh, you know, right through to uh, um, sport. You know, once we were pretty happy that our sports team was a place we could invest our trust and, and go down and watch our local footy team or support the national Australian cricket team. Now we even can't trust what our national cricket captains are going to be doing on a sporting field. And these may seem like isolated events. They may seem like a, a breakdown in one CEO or one politician or one sporting leaders. Uh, but it's not. It's systematic of a, a time we're living in where trust is becoming a currency that's become devalued. And we consciously are aware of it, but I think the reality is it really impacts young people. They're growing up in a world now, and many who have been born in a world where Donald Trump is the president. I'm trying to avoid politics, but I did spend uh, the second half of 2019 working with the US uh, Democratic presidential candidate, so I'm putting my politics on the table there. Um, Donald Trump as a president, Brexit happening, 
a institutional uh, order, an international institutional order has been broken where we've been unable to support um, millions affected in war in Syria and Yemen and uh, young people are sort of coming to age in this time and saying, is this right? Where's the ethics? Where's the morality? And that has a lot of implications. Um, so without going too deep and dark, what I want to do is just take two issues, as I said, um, that I think are important, one national, one global, but they both have national and global implications. Uh, look at the issue and the problem, but also provide uh, part of a solution and to leave you with an insight into one organisation that I work with and another that uh, I'm aware of through some of my business partners. Um, so if this commits, the first one I wanted to look at is a uh, national problem that again has international um, uh, ramifications but also uh, is a, definitely a global problem, but it's violence against children. Uh, globally we live in a world where one child dies every five minutes as a result of violence. And that amounts to 18.4% of kids globally that will not reach their 18th birthday without facing physical and or sexual violence. That's a conservative estimate from the World Health Organization. Um, one in five kids that will be affected by violence before turning 18, physical and or sexual. Uh, that's excluding emotional violence. Um, Australia, the stats are a little bit better um, better is probably not the right term, but at least not as severe. Uh, one in 22 kids in Australia will face physical and or sexual violence before turning 18. Um, it is certainly a national problem, um, and it's a heightened time of sensitivity with uh, the tragic passing of Hannah Baxter and her three children in, in Brisbane from an abusive former partner. Um, but nationally, we live in a country where one woman will be killed every week by an intimate partner. Police are called uh, to a domestic violence incident every two minutes. Um, three DVOs are breached every hour. And Indigenous Australians are seven times more likely, Indigenous children, sorry, are seven times more likely to face physical and or sexual violence before turning 18. We're living in a country where an Indigenous child is seven times more likely to face violence than a non-Indigenous child. This has had the attention of politis politicians, media, even corporate Australia. Um, we're seeing a positive message being spun out by national and state governments, um, but the problem remains, the systemic problem remains. Um, I won't go into why, I've got some pretty deep uh, concerns about some of the accessibility of pornography for young boys that are channeling and turning them into men that expect and demand um, certain sexual behaviours from women. Um, but we're also living in a systematic culture where uh, toxic masculinity exists. We're happy to call it out, but it still exists. And as someone that's played football for 23 years, uh, consecutive years, uh, I can tell you that toxic masculinity still exists. You see it in the locker rooms, you hear it, and it gets called out, and then it gets forgotten about after one beer. I promise not to um, focus too much on the problem, but I, I, I do know that um, most of you are aware how bad of an issue this is. I wanted to provide uh, a little bit of insight, I guess a snapshot to what a group of young Australians that I had the privilege of working with um, for a number of years uh, were doing to stand up to this issue. And so. Why well, I got the organisation that I co-founded in 2008. Um, in 2014, launched the Polished Man campaign. Um, so a lot of our work was focused on um, children, uh, some of the most marginalised, vulnerable, weak, oppressed, uh, meek children living across uh, disadvantaged communities around the world. We um, were horrified, like most of you, of the level of violence that permeates and exists around the world. and. Um, one thing that we noticed at looking at this issue was there were some so many remarkable organisations globally that worked on the supply end. What happens to women and children that are affected by violence? And we were funding some of these groups across sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and even in Australia. But in our analysis, what we realised was very, very few organisations in 2014 when we started 
this campaign, very few organisations working on the demand end. Who's working with men to curb this problem? And globally, we only found a handful of groups, um, the best probably being a South African organisation. And it created us, even in our sort of late 20s, to stop, pause and think and say, well, why is it more being done? We know we need to fund the solution, but we've also got to deal with the demand end. So what we did um, in 2014 was flick on a website. Um, our budget for our first year Polish Man campaign was $8,000. Um, I remember pitching it to the managing director of one of Australia's largest uh, creative uh, firms, um, creative agencies. I won't tell you their name, but um, he effectively looked at me back over the table and said, you've got to be bloody crazy. Like, you're never going to get men to paint a fingernail. That's just not going to happen in Australia. Um, that was interesting advice. I didn't listen to him. Um, we flicked on a website and uh, spent a bit of money uh, on posters and um, through social media we asked family and friends to paint one fingernail for the month of October in 2014 uh, to represent the one child that dies every five minutes as a result of violence. Uh, but to also signify uh, the one child uh, affected by, the one in five children affected by violence globally. Um, we had uh, 1,600 men sign up that year, uh, raised quarter of a million dollars in two weeks and I happily sent that managing partner an email and said, no, I think you're wrong here. Um, so that was uh, validation and proof that um, Australian men were willing to challenge a gender norm um, and wear nail polish for the month of October and in doing so support ending violence against children. Uh, fast forward six years, the campaign's been run every year in October from 2014 to 2019 and plans to be run again this year. Uh, Polish Man has gone global beyond our immediate network in sort of Melbourne on social media. Um, but we can proudly, I can proudly tell you that in the six years we've had over 140,000 men in 122 countries sign up, paint one finger now and actively fundraise to raise over $7 million to support women and children affected by some of the worst forms of violence. Um, so what that tells me is that men are willing to stand up men are willing to say no, and there are enough good men to build a community uh, to stand up against an issue like this. Polish man in isolation will not solve a global slash, slash uh, national problem like ending violence against children, but it can be part of a broader solution, part of the state government, federal government initiatives, the Royal Commissions, uh, the courts, the institutional work that's happening, uh, media, and then day-to-day -day conversations, conversations at the footy club, at the pub, at the workplace, uh, to ensure that we're illustrating to young men, young boys who are becoming men, that uh, there's a culture saying no. As strong as a toxic masculinity culture is, there's a strong enough culture to debunk that and to counter it, and willing to um, illustrate to, men, to young boys that um, standing up to violence is more important than being part of a toxic culture. The second issue that I wanted to touch on um, is relevant for a number of reasons. Um, we have all lived through a traumatic summer, uh, no matter what part of Australia you've been in, and uh, I think it's fair to say that 2020 certainly feels like a year for positive action on climate change, at least I hope so. Um, and in doing so, it's providing such voice and agencies to young Australians that are, that are willing to stand up and say enough is enough um, and to control or at least contribute to uh, being part of a solution to having a very different relationship with Mother Nature. The one issue I want to look at um, is the problem of and our dependency on petroleum based plastic and it's relevant for all of us because most of us are unconscious to how dependent we are on plastic and um, prior after I resigned as the YGAP CEO in uh, mid 2018 and had the privilege of going back to university in the UK and, and doing a postgraduate program and uh, while studying there uh, going to Tesco's and Sainsbury's you realize how uh, insidious sort of plastic has become you walk into any of the supermarkets and you can barely buy an apple or banana without it being wrapped in plastic um, it's almost impossible to eliminate plastic from your life. And so part of the research that I've been looking at 
for a new venture with uh, a few friends is looking at um, this problem of petroleum-based plastic and uh, why it is so uh, locked in and secured in our lifestyle uh, and effectively how dependent we are. So as a backdrop, um, petroleum-based plastic is, uh, needless to say, made from non-renewable uh, resources, oil, gas and coal. Um, plastic takes up to 500 years to break down and even when it does break down, it only breaks down into microplastics. Um, plankton uh, usually eat the microplastics, uh, mistaking it for squid eggs, which means that as it moves up the fish chain from plankton into smaller fish, into larger fish, into sharks and whales, um, unconsciously we're all eating microplastics with every piece of seafood we have. Um, plastics kills hundreds of thousands of turtles, penguins and dolphins each year. In Australia, uh, we produce 3 million tonnes of plastic per annum. 3 million tonnes. And of that 3 million tonnes, 130,000 tonnes of our plastic ends up in the ocean. 130,000 tonnes per year from Australia, and that's a conservative estimate, ends up in the ocean. We, and I assume uh, everyone's quite conscious of some of the um, focus on the recycling industry, uh, and the lid has kind of been lifted in Australia with um, our problem with recycling, specifically here in Melbourne. Uh, currently, only 9% of what we recycle is downcycled. So as individuals, and I assume everybody in this room um, is a participant of recycling well, uh, and as industries, we go to that effort of you know breaking down our um, recycling, putting food waste into some form of compost, and hopefully putting your plastic, your paper, your cardboard, and, and your plastics into the recycling bin, washing off oils. Even when we go through that process, only 9% gets downside. And uh, the reason is simple. It's cheaper to produce a new plastic than it is for these companies to turn recycled old plastic into a new renew, a re reused plastic. Um, in July 2018, two significant things happened in July in the past two years. In July 2018, China turned around and said we're no longer buying Australia's landfill. And it was unexpected and a quick snap decision by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, which uh, paralysed our Australian government. Um, most people are unaware that uh, we just sell our landfill to China. It uh, effectively doesn't mean that the problem is gone, it's just buried in a mine in China. And China turned around as an emerging growing economy and said we no longer need the world's um, pollution and uh, their landfill, so they stopped buying it globally. This has led to other countries, Indonesia, Philippines, following suit. Then the second thing that happened in July, one year later, in 2019, was there was a fire at the SKM plant in Blackerton North uh, in Melbourne. And I think, for myself included, I've just come back from the UK, and I think for a lot of people it was a rude awakening um, of what was happening inside a recycling plant. As the fire, um, fired, firefighters went there to put out the fire, uh, journalists followed the issue in the case and we found out that a lot of that uh, recycled goods, what we thought was what recycled goods, was ending up in landfill. And the um, company was exposed for effectively taking that recycling and, and dumping it in landfill. Um, I want to consciously assume that everyone knows how bad plastic is, but it, how unavoidable it seems in our lifestyle, in our, in our current life. I want to um, just provide a really innovative solution. Uh, and it's a US company who I'm meeting with next week uh, and trying to bring their technology out to Australia because it's a bit of a game changer. Um, it's really difficult for any company to compete with the fossil fuel industry. Um, and I can say that black and white. And no offence if there are members of the fossil fuel industry here, but I'm going to be blunt, you're on the earth. <laughs> um, and it's an issue for young Australians. It is the major issue, environmental climate change issue. and. Last year alone, the fossil fuel industry spent $200 billion, $200 billion in setting up new plastic facilities because the individuals and industries are changing their dependency on uh, energy. Uh, we are driving, uh, we're catching more public transport, we're riding bikes, we're using electric cars, 
Uh, we're consciously moving away from um, traditional forms of energy, using solar panels, wind panels, etc. Wind turbines, sorry. Um, and so the fossil fuel industries uh, need to have a home for their byproduct and for their traditional assets. And the plastic industry is the perfect place for it. As uh, much of the developing world across uh, Africa and, and Southeast Asia uh, moves into a more developed economy, uh, they're consuming a lot more, and as the population grows, uh, plastic is a growing industry. Um, the $200 billion spent by the fossil fuel industry alone last year into the plastic industry amounts to a, a number of new facilities, 35 alone in the US and, and many more around the world. One of those facilities alone is equivalent to 800,000 new cars on the road. So all this work we do with encouraging our kids to ride bikes, and to jump onto the trams and to you know, avoid um, buying cars as many young people are doing um, as ride sharing becomes more popular, we are uh, debunked in our efforts by the fossil fuel industry that continues to set up facilities uh, with one facility equivalent to 800,000 cars alone. So, the reason they're hard to take on, uh, besides the money they have, um, the lobby groups they have, I got sent an article last week, a really compelling, well-written, well-researched article, effectively saying how plastic's not the problem, it's how we recycle that's the problem, and when you look at the author, look at the journal he's writing for, you look who funds the journal, the writing for, you look at the foundation that they own, you look at the company that runs it, it all goes back to the fossil fuel industry. And uh, the, coming to my point, the reason it's so difficult is besides the lobby groups, besides, besides that money they got, is we as consumers are still not willing to pay a little bit more for non petroleum based plastic. And uh, there are groups emerging onto the market um, offering PLA and PHA, which are uh, bio polyamers that are, are alternatives to petroleum. Um, they're really good in the sense that they do not depend on non-renewable resources, so they're not made from oil, coal, gas. Um, most of the PHA and PLAs in the market are made from cornstarch and sugar. Um, so at least they're not made from non-renewable sources and they will break down a lot easier. Um, there's two problems with the current market, and that's that growing um, cornstarch or growing um, uh, sugar is not cost effective, it's quite expensive, so uh, no matter what, uh, these alternatives, these bioplastics are going to be more expensive right now than traditional bio, than traditional petroleum-based plastic. Um, and secondly, we don't have the system in Australia, we don't have the facility in Australia yet to have an industrial furnace to break down some of these um, bioplastics. So they're made from a better source, but they still end up in landfill. So consumers sort of turn around and say, well, people stuff it, I'll, I'll get the cheap forks and coals and all this, or I'll get the takeaway plastic. Um, and off a global $720 billion industry that petroleum-based plastic is, um, these small PLA, PHAs only make up about $46 million right now. So it's a very small um, competitor. Where I'm landing with this is um, a very innovative solution that uh, has been developed by a group of young environmental engineers led by two twins, uh, a few years older than me, Jeff and Dane Anderson, who are environmental engineers and scientists. And they've developed the world's first country, uh, country, that's interesting. Um, I think Captain Cook had something to say about that. Uh, they've developed the world's first company that uh, converts organic food waste into bioplastic. And so they've got a, a, a facility in Mountain View, California, uh, that effectively converts through bacteria, organic food waste, into a PHA, which is a biopolyama resin, which then can be converted into bioplastic. Why this company, Full Cycle Bioplastics, is a game changer is it's solving two problems with one hit. Currently, 80% of our food waste uh, ends up in landfill and that leads to contamination and disease. Um, we have just seen an announcement last week by the Victorian State Government to move to a green bin, including food waste and other greens. Um, every piece of food waste that's thrown into the bin uh, at this stage ends up leading to, to contamination and can cause diseases. 
Um, so the 80% that's thrown into food waste and not being composted is a problem. So they're solving one problem by taking this compost and this green waste and turning it into a bioplastic. Um, this, the other reason it's a game changer is it can finally compete with petroleum-based plastic. The raw material is free or cost neutral. So unlike corn starch and, and sugar that has a price and an environmental cost, water, to grow corn or to grow sugar, this has a zero cost. You're taking food waste and converting it in as raw material, converting it to PHA resin. So to end with uh, why I think this technology is so important to Australia, and um, we'll be encouraging the state and federal government to look at bringing this technology out to Australia and, and compete at scale, um, is its degradability. Um, so right now, uh, as I mentioned at the start of this problem, um, Petroleum-based plastic takes up to 500 years to break down, and even when it starts to break down, um, it leads to microplastics. Um, full cycle bioplastic, and we've seen some videos, and I'll, I'll be uh, visiting the facility next week, uh, but the bioplastics that they've developed, you can, in a non-organic environment, it stays stable. So if you've got the water bottle in your hand that's made from full cycle, it will be as stable as petroleum-based plastic water bottle. If it's in your fridge, it's completely fine. Due to the bacteria it's built with from the food waste, once it's in an organic environment, so once you put it in your soil, in your backyard, it begins to degrade. You know, the bacteria in the soil in an organic environment will start to mix with the bacteria in the water bottle or whatever the bioplastic is uh, turned into. And so within two weeks uh, in your backyard in the soil, it can completely degrade. Within a few months, you can one of these bioplastics in the ocean, and in a few months, because it's a bit cooler uh, temperature, within a few months it completely degrades and turns into food for fish. So an absolute game changer compared to plankton eating microplastics, which moves up the food chain. Um, it's very new to me. I, I didn't know a lot about bioplastics seven weeks ago, but um, I think it's a really important issue for our country and more broadly for the world. Uh, I'll wrap it up because uh, I'm quite conscious you're, you're hungry and um, uh, want to enjoy some lunch. Uh, I, I do want to end just with this um, important message, and it's a, a very simple one because you're all conscious of how young people are finding their voice and stepping into their potential. And um, this is a remarkable time we're living in. Um, Malala. Uh, Went to Tulmerg right through to Jackson Saunders, who was uh, photographed earlier. Jackson is an 11 year old Melbourneian boy who has raised uh, close to $180,000 for a college man. Uh, every year he paints his fingernails and gets his school to sign up and gets everyone around him to donate and runs events. Um, and you have 11 year olds standing up and saying no to any violence against children. Um, when you have young Pakistani students standing up and saying no to the Taliban and demanding that she, as a female student, has a right to education. When you have 16-year-olds going on strikes from school and creating a global movement around the world, you know the collective consciousness is shifting and there's a transfer of power away from traditional institutions and sources uh, into the hands of young people. Uh, so it may be a fitting baton that I pass over as I enter into my real adulthood at 35, um, knowing full well that there are so many young, remarkable Australians and remarkable leaders around the world that are standing up and uh, saying no to our collective national and international problems. Uh, thanks for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. If not, we can have a chat at lunch.